digression means that you subtract to spectra and investigate this difference. Actually, we uh, had already at least two talks about dichroism. Diana Benea spoke about magnetic Compton scattering, that was also about dichroism, difference between spin up and spin down. And uh, Jan Minar, Jürgen Brand mentioned spin polarized and arpes again you measure difference between the two spectra. I am going to talk about uh, differences in uh, X-ray absorption spectra. In this respect, my talk is kind of a spin-off of the talk of John Rare. Ah, that's what I thought. I tried it before. Uh, why didn't you do it before? Anyhow, uh, so I'll start a bit with uh, interaction about X-ray absorption and about polarization of X-rays. Then I'll talk uh, about uh, the first acronyms comes XLD, X-ray linear dichroism. Uh, most of my uh, topic will be, most of my time will be spent on X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. I'll talk about the benefits, but I'll focus rather on the risks. I'll talk uh, shortly about X-ray magnetic linear dichroism, XMLD. That will be rather a precursor to the uh, kind of a case study of, uh, why don't you go out, uh, of, uh, uh, who knows? Sorry. Uh, of the uh, study of nonlinear systems, I wonder. Ah, great. So, X ray absorption spectra means that you have X rays that come in and you measure the absorption co coefficient, how much spectra were absorbed by the sample, and you investigate it as a function of the energy of the incoming X rays. Uh, a lot of processes contribute to this absorption, but here we focus on the process, on the, the, the absorption of the X-rays on uh, core electrons, on the core electron photoelectric effect. Ah, yeah. So uh, there are electrons in the core level, X-rays come, and uh, electrons are ejected into unoccupied states. So in this way, we can. Uh, think of the X-ray absorption spectra as a measure of uh, the structure of unoccupied electron states. Uh, yeah, they, the, what, what's actually specific is that we observe these unoccupied states from a well-defined location, because the electrons, the core electrons, start from, the, from one specific uh, atom. Chemical selectivity is probably, I would say, the reason why X-ray absorption is popular. That means that uh, actually it's the Christine already spoke about it when she spoke about XPS. This is characteristic spectrum. So the, mm, if, you, uh, if you, let's say, increase, you have a certain structure of core levels. If you increase the energy of the incoming X-rays, one day it, the energy will reach such a level that another core electron will be ejected. At that moment, the absorption coefficient jumps suddenly, and you know that close to that absorption edge, you have the X-ray absorption solely, or practically solely, on account of, say, 1S level it, of certain element, calcium, it's sky edge, 2S level of iron, L1 edge, and so on. And because these uh, uh, core levels of each element has got, have got different energy, you are chemically specific. So that you know that you observe the unoccupied states as seen from the iron or any other element. Yeah. X-rays. Uh, light is polarized. There is a, uh, the wave function is described by this form. Here is the amplitude. It's uh, perpendicular to the direction of the spreading of the uh, uh, of the spreading of the waves. Uh, light can be polarized linearly. In that case, we've got the polarization vector here, or it can be polarized circularly, left or right. In that case, the wave vector can be symbolically, or not that symbolically, written as a combination of the X and Y component. This is in case that the direction of the incoming rays is parallel to Z. If it's parallel to another direction, you just permutate these labels. Ah. 
uh, what matters in is interaction of this radiation with electrons uh, described by the relativistic or non-relativistic interaction Hamiltonian. Here is the uh, amplitude of the uh, photons of the X-rays, uh, either linearly polarized or circularly polarized. And this uh, exponential can be expanded in Taylor expansion. Jan Minar already spoke about it, I believe. And so uh, you can focus on the first term that would give you dipole term, or you can add another term that would give you quadrupole term. Here you stop. Uh, the dipole term, uh, after some gymnastics, you get a matrix element that uh, contains the polarization vector. So the intensity of the dipole transition depends on the direction of the polarization vector. That's why we have got this dichroism. The quadrupole term in the non-relativistic non case have got in the matrix element the polarization vector, but also the direction of the radiation. So the quadrupole, the in intensity of quadrupole transitions depends not only on the direction of the polarization vector, but also on the direction from which the uh, incoming radiation arrives. That's the difference with respect to, to, to dipole polarization. If it's dipole polarization, it matters. If, if it's dipole polarization, what matters is just direction of the polarization matter, vector. It doesn't matter whether the direction itself comes from front, left, right, whatever. Yeah, so that was the introduction. Now the real stuff. Uh huh. So uh, suppose we've got uh, linearly polarized light. So uh, just on this cartoon, we can see that we probe. Uh, we saw uh, many pictures of these scatterings, multiple scatterings. Here we are, this multiple scattering. The electron is ejected from here. And it's ejected because the light is polarized. It's ejected preferentially in this direction. And the electron is scattered of these uh, neighbors. So if uh, the uh, light is polarized in a different way, the electron, the core, uh, initially called electrons, are ejected in different direction. So they probe the surroundings in a bit different way. Yeah? Either you probe the ceiling or you probe the walls. Uh, the walls and uh, that means that you see different spectra. So what you've got is the X-ray linear dichroism XLD. That would be the difference between the absorption spectra for one polarization vector and for another polarization vector. Typically, you take them perpendicular to get maximum contrast. Not always you can, but uh, now the terminology, right? Sometimes you can speak about polarization. OK, so you can just focus on the X-ray absorption spectra. That would be the sun and the difference. So you investigate X-ray absorption spectrum, XAS, and X-ray linear decrease, XLLD, or you just keep these spectra separately. It doesn't matter. In that case, you just investigate the polarized spectra. Sometimes people speak about also about angular-dependent spectra because it's uh, linked to the way it is uh, actually measured. So you have got uh, typically you say so, so you've got your polarized radiation that comes from the synchrotron and, and any other uh, instrument with polarized vector and you've got sample I hope I won't break anything and you uh, rotate the sample uh, so it's angle dependent because the spectra depends on the angle of your sample with respect to whatever so you can speak about polarized spectra or angular dependent spectra or XLD you always mean the same Right, um, this dichroism can have geometric component, dependent with uh, link to the fact that you've got different atoms in different direction. It can have also a magnetic component. I won't talk about it now. I will talk about it later. Right. Generally, uh, if you uh, really make a proper uh, analysis of all these tensors, you've got this spheric. I, I think it's called. Uh, I don't know how it's called. It's some tensor, whatever. I don't remember the name. But the intensity of the polar polarized uh, light can be for dipole transition depends on the uh, direction of the polarization vector. For quadrupole polariz uh, transition, it depends on the uh, uh, direction of the polarized vector and the incoming radiation. All these components are not. Uh, 
dependent it depends on the symmetry of the crystal so if it's cubic you've got just one polarized you, you've got just one component and uh, you don't get any dichroism uh, depending on the symmetry of the system the number of uh, you can get now i forgot between one and four i believe uh, independent dipole components and the number of quadruple components is i believe between two or seven but i don't know but actually this is a nice paper of christian Bourdais. You can find it often, actually. What mostly, frankly, is uh, uh, made use is that you've got a system if, uh, that is quite symmetric. So if you've got a rotation axis of order greater than two, often you've got these, uh, there are just two components. Uh, and so you've got really dichroism because there are two di uh, spectral components and uh, the spectrum just uh, depends on the angle this was this angular dependence uh, in this way. That's uh, actually the most frequent form of dichroism you meet in your life. Right. Uh, what is this uh, XLD linear dichroism good for? Generally, you've got more data. If you've got more data, you've got more information. Uh, so uh, you use often X-ray absorption spectra to fit the structure. Maurizio Benfato's talk. If you've got more data, your uh, results are more reliable. Uh, right. Huh. Polarized spectra, by providing you mo more data, actually also present more stringent tests for the theory. It may happen that your calculation gives you good results for the average spectrum for XAS, but it fails for, pol uh, or fails, let, let's say, doesn't perform so good uh, for polarized spectra, for dichroism. So practical advice, if you want to demonstrate that your theory works, it's better to, uh, to stay away from the polarized spectra. You may learn something you don't want to know. Uh, and uh, actually, the thing which I quite like is that uh, because the uh, intensity of the spectra depends on this polarization vector in a different way for dipole and for quadrupole transitions, by uh, monitoring this uh, polarization or direction, whatever dependence, you can distinguish between, uh, sorry, between dipole and quadrupole transitions, which uh, otherwise is not that easy suppose that you want to know it. Right, so uh, some examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is co actually quite an old example, but I like it because I think it's instructive. So there was a case, you've got a nickel surface, oxygen absorbing on it, and you want to know where this guy is sitting, atop, hollow, uh, what is it, bridge, hollow, and it can be in one distance or above the surface or lower distance above the surface. So you calculate the spectra. Here's the calculated spectra. You compare it uh, with, uh, with uh, a polarized spectrum with angle dependent spectra in this case. Okay, so this is angle dependent spectra. And um, so you check where you get the best agreement and uh, you find the winner in this case would be the uh, ho hollow adsorption side with vertical distance 0 0.9 angstroms. This is the illustration, right? Uh, I had here, here originally also another example of <laughs> Maurizio Benfatos when he showed this hemoglobin, right? So it was similar stuff. Anyhow, uh, another instructive example, I would say, uh, zinc oxide doped by cobalt. And uh, so the question here is, people were thinking, now they are not, because they know, is this, uh, is this um, uh, cobalt atom sitting in an interstitial position or in a substitutional position? It can be O substitution, zinc substitution. So you measure the spectrum, uh, two components, so the polarized spectrum, you simulate it, and you measure the dichroism, that's the difference between the two spectra between it would be between the red and uh, red, red and black spectra. You measure it, and you get a good agreement. Good, I would say, frankly, very good, uh, based on my experience. Very good experience, uh, very good agreement between theory and experiments. So you can be quite sure that cobalt atoms are sitting in ZN substitutional sites. Why? What did I do? Ah, right. Um, 
this is uh, not so practical issue, but it may help you understand. Let me say so. Uh, some links between structural units and sense features. Actually, also some, some uh, as I understand, some approaches to extract structural information from Xane spectra is based on this uh, philosophy that certain features are linked to certain structural units. So uh, this is an unpolarized, po polarizationally average spectrum of V2O. And uh, here is a polarized spectrum, and you can simulate it. Um, so from the unpolarized spectra, you don't learn more. You, you do not learn much. But if you uh, simulate a spectrum uh, for, s s s s let's say, uh, as you make various structure units, you find that this strong feature, this strong peak, appears if there is an uh, asymmetric neighborhood around the va vanadium atoms and a very short uh, vanadium oxygen bond is present. This is uh, uh, another very old uh, paper which I like, I have to admit. Um, there was kind of a uh, this concern the discussion whether the uh, transition is dipole or quadrupole. So here is a, a little pre-peak. If you don't see it, still believe me, it is here. And the point is this pre-peak. Is it dipole or quadrupole? So uh, this guy, uh, I mean, the, the mm, molecule, it was a complex, actually. But the center was this kind of a square molecule. So uh, if you make the proper uh, analysis, you find out that the dipole transition does not depend on how you orient this square, right? The, however, the quadrupole uh, transition would depend on it. And they measured the intensity of this little pre-peak depending on the uh, angle. So this is, again, angular dependent spectra. And they saw this nice periodicity, the fold pole periodicity. So that was quite, I would say, uh, solid proof that this pre-peak is quadrupole. So the linear dichroism can tell you also this stuff, which otherwise, uh, well, in my opinion, this is real proof, I would uh, admit. Otherwise, you've got just indications or evidences. All right. Why? Yeah. Linear dichroism, uh, sorry, magnetic circular dichroism. It starts with circular light. I would start with kind of a uh, warning. Um, and so the light can be left circularly polarized or right circularly polarized. Right? The problem is what is left and what is right. And so actually uh, don't get intimidated if the signs somehow don't uh, add up because there is actually ambiguity in the conventions. Usually in optics people use the convention that uh, this, if the polarization vector is in this way, it's a left circularly polarized and if it's uh, in this way, it's a right circularly polarized, but uh, in particle physics, they use different convention. If you want to uh, co bypass this ambiguity, focus on helicity, that is the projection of the particle spin. And again, usually in optics or in X-rays, we use that positive helicity means that the photon is a left circularly, this awful word, circularly polarized. Simply, whatever. It's enough for you to remember that there are this ambiguity in the convention, so just don't get, don't get intimidated. If the signs are different, so fine, they are different. Forget it. Uh, I talk about magnetism, so a short introduction to magnetism. Electron can get uh, magnetic moments either by spinning, so this is the spin magnetic moment. The electron is rotating about its axis. Actually, it's not. You must not say it because actually it's quantum object, blah, blah, blah. But as long as you keep this for yourself and don't ten tell anyone, you can just imagine the spin magnetic moment of the electron comes from the electron rotating around its axis. For, say, the 3D transition metals, for iron, it's about two. And its magnitude does not depend on the direction of the magnetic moment, right? more or less, uh, practically. Or there's another source of magnetic moment is the orbital moment of electron. So it depends that the electron is so, I, I'm not going to demonstrate it running around. <laughs> and <laughs> the, this magnetic moment for electron is rather small and it's, <laughs> 
and its magnitude depends on the direction because uh, right it depends basically when he's running around he's colliding with other atoms so you can imagine depending on which atoms he collides uh, the uh, that will affect the the magnitude of this orbital component orbital magnetic moment uh, there is a lot of fuss about this orbital magnetic moment one can think why if it is so small so why who cares well, actually, uh, if you say care about magnetocrystal anisotropic, then you care. And this is this spintronics and all these words, I mean, you have to use to get uh, money. So um, it makes sense to focus on it. Uh, just uh, recall the Bruno formula, for instance. This is the magnetocrystal anisotropy energy is more or less proportional to the difference between orbital and magnetic moment for two perpendicular directions of the magnetization, right? So. Yes, it makes sense to focus on orbital magnetic moment. And as I will tell, tell, uh, show in the moment, X-ray magnetic cycle decreasing is quite an efficient way to measure spin and orbital magnetic moment separately. Uh, the uh, XMCD and also this orbital magnetic moment is dependent on the spin-orbit interaction. Spin-orbit interaction is a relativ relativistic, I'm not in my shape today. Anyway, it's a relativistic uh, effect which follows from the Dirac equation. You can also uh, insert it into Schroeder equation as a perturbation and the uh, proper expression has got here uh, uh, orbital and spin. So it's in this case it would be orbital spin interaction but it's actually spin orbit interaction. Yes, yeah, spin orbit coupling or spin orbit interaction, whatever. Uh, right, uh, here's this uh, gradient of potential so just looking on this expression you would say fine this spin orbit interaction would be large for core electrons and it is actually for instance the difference between l2 and l3 edges in iron uh, is because of this spin orbit interaction and it's also large for heavy elements so if you do with transuranides for instance but also i mean uh, yesterday or i don't know but People spoke, for instance, about, about states on gold, I believe, right? Why gold? Because gold is a heavy element and it will induce its spin orbit coupling. So, anyway, yeah, it's the only way the magnetic moment direction is coupled to crystal at this, this spin orbit coupling, uh, uh, interaction, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, yeah, another intermezzo because I'll uh, to say introduce the um, few following slides. Uh, we care about magnetism for low-dimensional uh, low systems because uh, if the system is low-dimensional, it's cluster ad atom just surface. The coordination number is smaller, and if you and in magnetism, less is more. So the uh, smaller is the uh, coordination number, the larger is the magnetic moment per atom generally, right? Uh, um, low dimensional systems have large magnetic crystal anisotropy for the atoms. You know why this is important. And uh, yeah, on the other hand, because uh, I mean, magnet to investigate magnetic crystals is difficult. I mean, you cannot really put it into a squid and measure the magnetization because the amount of the magnetic material is very small. However, you can measure it by chemically specific X-ray absorption spectroscopy. That's actually uh, one of the reasons why X-ray absorption uh, wins and so on. Fine. So XSCD actually means that you have got your system that is magnetized. You shine on it X-rays with helicity either parallel or anti-parallel. That means left or right circularly polarized light and you measure the difference. Spin orbit coupling is necessary for this XMCD. Right, so this is my symbolic way. Right, uh, quick and dirty way how the X ray magnetic circle dichroism arises. Uh, mm, actually, it's a funnel effect from the photo emission. So uh, you shine your uh, polari polarized light, and uh, the photon has got uh, angular momentum, and angular momentum of this photon interacts with spin of the electron via spin orbit coupling. And so uh, the left and the right circular polar light, light gives rise right to, to the photocurrent that uh, is, has got a bit di different spin. So you got a bit spin and balance from left and right circular polar light uh, photons. And this uh, spin imbalance current, let me say, is then detected by the valence band 
because the, if your system is v magnetic, so you've got again different space in spin up, spin down electrons. So to get XMCD, you need spin orbit coupling to get this spin imbalance and magnetism to detect it. This is a quick and dirty way. You can make it more formal. You can say, find a spin orbit coupling makes that the relativistic wave function. They depend on kappa and mu. And uh, the transition probabilities depend on this mu, uh, the, which is kind of a relativistic analog of the m magnetic quantum number of initial and final states. And the magnetic order makes that you have different numbers of available final states. And so on, and so you get this. So, so I mean, you may have heard this. Uh, you may, actually, I think you can find it in that book that was here available, right? This uh, graph where you have kind of a schematic depiction of uh, the intensities from between various transitions. This is for left and for right, it will be different. And so, so you basically, in this way, you got it in the more honest way. This is how it's cal calculated in the end. Uh, uh, if your initial state are s-states, that's k edge, you don't have spin orbit coupling, uh, you don't have orbital moment in the uh, in initial states, so you are uh, basically left with spin orbit coupling with the final p states, which is smaller than say for, 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 for so so uh, in short, XMCD on k levels is typically by order of magnitude maybe two, um, two order of magnitudes smaller than on L3 levels, just in case that you come across it, we will not really need it. I like this, anatomy of X-ray uh, XMCD. The point is this. Uh, this, uh, hmm, the ab this is an uh, absorption spectrum of iron L2, L3 edge, right? L2, L3. You've got uh, two levels here, four levels here, spin orbit coupling between them. Uh, in except so, so right so the spectrum uh, actually arises by uh, ejecting electrons from all these six levels so you ought add have to add these four curves each of them con corresponds to one of these levels and you get a uh, absorption spectrum that's normal this this is not so but however for xmcd it's also normal but what i would like to uh, somehow draw attention is that for xmcd this nice peak actually is composed of uh, in this case of two peaks two electrons uh, sorry four electrons is lh uh, l3h so you've got four levels here and this L2H is, comes from these two electrons. So you've got actually two curves here, four curves here, and not of all of them have the same sign. So actually, yes, here actually the outcome is that you've got just, just a sim single boring peak, but it doesn't have to be always that case, and there may be some tricks in it. Okay. Yeah, some rules. This is actually what makes XMCD so great. Uh, so this is again a typical spectrum. Yeah, this is iron edge, I believe, but never mind. A any transition metal spectrum would look like that. So you uh, measure the X-ray absorption spectrum, and you've got peak areas as associated with L3 transition and peak area associated with L2 transition. You have the difference, the XMCD spectrum, you've got peak area again associated with L3 transition with L2 peaks. So yeah, anyway. And by doing some algebra on these peak areas, so you subtract them or you add them, you uh, yeah you got so this would be the algebra on this uh, on these peak areas. So you got an expression that contains just the spin magnetic moment separately, orbital magnetic moment separately. There's number of holes in the d band here. Oh yeah, that's yeah. This is something you can either measure or calculate. And here, for the spin moment, you don't get just the spin moment, but something about what you might call effective spin moment. So it's uh, added with some magnetic dipole term I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the some rules were derived, uh, assuming various uh, approximations, simplifications. They were derived uh, roughly in 1990 by Toll, Van der Laan, Altarelli someone else, Paolo Cara also. Anyway, so the most important uh, condition is that you assume that you can isolate transition to 3D shell, which definitely you can for atoms, because in that case, you really have stress. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, frankly, you cannot in solid, because in solid, I mean, 
<laughs> the bands are extended, all right? So the, the, however, you can estimate it. You can say, okay. Anyway, then there are some other couple of other recoverance that, frankly, I would say are not that important. Uh, so for practical uh, uh, applications, the really what matters is how to uh, focus just here. So actually, I <laughs> they did here <laughs> kind of a cheated. Okay, so for the XMCD f for the spectrum we can say five. So this is L2. This will be uh, this is L3. This is L2. But already you need to normalize it. You need uh, for the absorption. So where the edge ends here, uh, where is 3D band and where is where the 4D band starts? Well, you don't know really. So anyway, you have to do some some tricks. You can do it, but basically, uh, yeah, you have to do some tricks. Uh, uh, just a remark uh, about the core hole. Uh, John already uh, Rare spoke about core hole among others, I believe. And uh, so the influence of the core hole in this some rules is somehow integrated out. So these integral quantities uh, should really be evaluated for the initial states without the core hole. So in this way, you measure the magnetic moment of the ground state. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, intermezzo. Uh, just for fun. Um, lately, uh, it has become uh, actually a focus of research that uh, y you want to have kind of a uh, formally exact theory of, or of orbital magnetic moment. Now, if you really take this intuitive definition of orbital magnetization, so here is this orbital moment, R times V, uh, you don't get a consistent uh, expression. You can get this consistent only for finite systems uh, because of this body R. If, it's, uh, if you have a uh, solid, so you don't get it. So, I mean, clever people uh, did a lot of research on it, and uh, so they came with this, uh, let me say, uh, gorgeously looking expression for the orbital magnetization, where you have got, it. basically they exploit concepts like very phase and similar stuff. And uh, actually it's a, a very fancy theory. And uh, you can also derive some magneto-optical sum rules based on this. So one can think that these sum rules uh, I, I mentioned before can be derived also in a bit more, let's say, formal exact way. However, not quite so, because in that way you can derive some rules that uh, basically con concern the whole spectral range. But you really actually want to focus just on the LH or KH or FH. So, so it's not really X-ray sum rules. It's just magneto-optical sum rules. Uh, but I mean, it can be done. Uh, I like it in a sense that these sum rules can be somehow uh, derived on also a formally exact basis, though to the best of my knowledge, there are no practical implications of this, but still, it's nice, I would say. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about it. Some rules, right. So you can say um, how they are really valid in practice. Can you rely on them? Uh, that means, uh, because I said, for instance, you've got issues, how would you define this 3D band? Right? So the point is, as I need, uh, at least ideologically easy way to check it. You calculate the X-ray absorption uh, spectrum, you calculate the XMCD spectra, you calculate the magnetic moment, you evaluate this expression, then basically compare results of magnetic moments directly obtained from the electronic structure and magnetic moments derived from this uh, gymnastics. So uh, um, you can do it for, because say, Mostly, you are not interested in one single number. You know what is the magnetic moment of iron. You don't have to measure it by, by some rules. But say what you are interested, how it changes, say, if you uh, are magnetic, uh, so say, if uh, 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 this iron atom is on gold, on silver, on iron, on something else. These trends, you've got cluster of iron, uh, iron clusters on nickel. How the magnetic moment changes if you vary the size of the cluster. So you calculate it, you calculate the Okay, so we calculate the spin magnetic moment, so, so you calculate the spectrum, you calculate the spin magnetic moment, in this way the orbital magnetic moment, or the ratio between orbital and spin magnetic moment, I mean effective magnetic moment, where is this, this, this term, you calculate it directly, and you calculate it from X-ray absorption spectrum. So you see that actually, the, in absolute numbers, there is actually sometimes quite a difference. However, that's not that important for you because you can normalize it so you add a constant, who cares? But the trend 
is the same or very similar, let me say. And uh, if you care about the ratio between orbital and spin magnetic moment, even the numbers are similar. So the trends are well reproduced by these some rules. Uh, so applying some rules for a sequence of related systems definitely makes sense. What at least. Sorry? What are the random blue? Uh, red, sorry, red is calculated directly from the electronic structure and blue is calculated from the uh, calculated spectra. So, so this is the spin magnetic moment divided by... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> this is, this is so wait a second, how do you get TC from XAS? Sorry? How do you get this TC from XAS? Uh, not, f uh, uh, well, I, I don't get it from XAS, but from the spectrum, I, I get, f from the spectrum, I get spin plus, t plus TZ. That's what I get by, integ by integrating the calculated spectra. I calculate the spectra. Yes. Perfect. So this is from the calculated spectra. Here I, I compare theory with theory. It should agree, I know. <laughs> but but uh, and for the red, it's just from the electronic structure. So you just run the electronic structure code and evaluate the magnetic moment. And there are some, I mean, Hubert would tell more about it. How you, you have these operators and these operators integrate this with, anyway. Uh, here is uh, the TZ John mentioned. So the problem is that the spin magnetic moment comes only, it, it's a full package. It comes only in combination with this uh, nasty magnetic dipole term. Actually, I don't know how it's called. Some call it magnetic dipole term or it's expectation value of the magnetic dipole operator or something like that. Don't, uh, anyway. So uh, the point is you can get a, uh, formal expression from that, that it doesn't tell you that much. I'll speak about it in a moment. Um, actually, it dip, it's called TZ because uh, it, is, it depends on the direction from which the in which the magnetization is defined. So this would be when the magnetization is along z-axis. If the magnetization is along x-axis, it would be a bit different. You've got here z, uh, x, y. So actually, I would rather talk about the alpha term, right? because uh, actually for polarized, polarized calculation or angular dependent calculation, dip. anyway, yeah. What to think of it? Often it is said that it is a measure of non-sphericity of the spin distribution of the system. That means, uh, in essence, uh, you can get it, you can think that uh, it's a measure of the spin magnetic moment resolved according to the magnetic quantum number. You know that, say, the charge, also the spin magnetic moment, typically are a result according to the orbital quantum number. So you've got S charge, P charge, or D charge, or the, the magnetic moment. For iron, for, for instance, it's mostly D component now. But there's also this another quantum number, the, the M quantum number. Usually it doesn't de depend. If, if the spin magnetic moment does not depend on the magnetic quantum number, the spin, uh, the, the dipole term is zero. If it depends, it's on zero, more or less. I've, uh, I simplified, but that's how you... Uh, okay, for bar systems, it is usually negligible, unless you deal with trans uranites and uh, systems with a huge spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. However, it can be uh, large, relatively large, I important, let me say, for surfaces, virus, low dimensional system. That means for that kind of systems for which X-ray absorption spectrum is, is actually great because that system that often can be very hardly uh, investigated in another way. So do we really ne need to care about this TZ? Uh, now, for investigating the trends, what matters is really whether the trends are the same. So, uh, I mean, if suppose the variations, if this TZ are small, then uh, you can more or less ignore it because in that case, so if there is some difference, so okay, this is a bit different. It's not quite the same case, but so if the magnetic, uh, suppose that this term is large but constant, it doesn't depend, say, on the cluster size or whatever. Well, then it's just a constant, so you renormalize your results and you don't care. However, if the variation uh, of this TZ term is large, comparable to variations of the spin magnetic moment, then you can get quite different results. Ah. So, uh, what we did is that uh, we made a, a s I mean, here in this case, 
it was fine, the trends were, were the same, but uh, right. So we um, uh, have a series of supported clusters. We evaluate the average spin magnetic moment and the average uh, some, uh, uh, say, effective spin magnetic moment, right? The quantity uh, measured by the sum rules. And you compare how these uh, two trends uh, compare depending on the cluster size. Uh, we made uh, two <laughs> series of clusters, of iron clusters, uh, on nickel, or, or, or iron cobalt clusters, on nickel and on gold. They have got different shapes, different sizes, not so important. So here are the results. So here is the uh, dependence of the effective magnetic moment. That's uh, the, what is measured by the sum rules. And here is the bare spin magnetic moment. So for iron atoms or nickel, both uh, quantities have the same trend. For nickel, uh, for cobalt or nickel, again, both quantities have the same trend. For iron uh, clusters or gold, again, you've got this, hey, okay, hey, you've got some hitch. Here is a bit of difference, but okay, you can leave it that. However, for uh, uh, cobalt or gold, you've got quite opposite trend for the effective spin magnetic moment that would be derived from the sum rules and by the spin magnetic moment that really is present on the clusters. So that means that here the magnetic dipole term that is a changes the picture completely. Uh, so if you focused on the sum rules and ignored the magnetic T-Z term, you would falsely assume that the uh, spin magnetic moment per atom increases uh, with the increasing cluster size. So you, you, you've got quite a wrong conclusion. Why it doesn't? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was laughing when other speakers had problems with that. Serves me right. So uh, the, the dipole term can also make the spin magnetic moment look anisotropic falsely. So we've got atom or monolayer, and the magnetization is either uh, in plane, right, or it can be out of plane, parallel to the plane. And the spin magnetic moment, as I said before, practically does not depend on the direction of the magnetization. However, the Tz, the dipole term, does. And so the sum of the spin plus the Tz term actually pretty depends on the direction of the magnetization. So that means if I here relied just on the XMCD sum rules, I would say, oh, this is interesting feature. The spin magnetic moment depends on the, on the direction of the magnetization. I made a big, big discovery. No, I just forgot about the Tz term. Uh, yeah. So uh, the point is, one would like to get rid of this TZ term, and I would say one is justified to get rid of that. So uh, actually, uh, hmm, right, if you uh, make again some uh, assumptions that basically, if you neglect the influence of the spin orbit coupling on the T alpha term, then uh, the TZ term or the alpha term can be eliminated from the spin moment uh, sum rule, either by that uh, you measure the XMCD spectrum for two perpendicular directions of the incoming radiation, or uh, you can make use of the magic angle, so that the this angle 55, uh, 54 would be the angle between the incoming light direction and the, and the uh, high symmetry of the system. So this would be if the influence of the spin orbit coupling over the TMS this term can be neglected. You can, by using spin, uh, by using polarized measurements, you can get rid of the, you can effectively eliminate this nasty this term from your results. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to check it, you just check this relation, whether it's true or not. So you will evaluate it for a series of systems, for monolayers, for cobalt monolayers on different surfaces, for cobalt atoms on different surfaces, and you compare it with the spin magnetic moment. That's the, what you are really interested in. And for monolayer, this ratio is really small. That means if you are interested, interested in monolayer, you can el effectively eliminate by doing your measurements cl uh, cleverly you can uh, uh, eliminate this, this teaser term from your measurements. However, for atom, actually you cannot. You can get quite, uh, say, 
20% error, that's I would say a relatively large error or 30% error. Now one can think this, this does not make sense to me because cobalt and <laughs> copper, they are systems with small spin orbit coupling. So I mean, uh, how, how does it come that uh, influence of spin orbit coupling on the TZ term cannot be neglected in these systems? Be it uh, iron, uh, I mean, be it gold, I would say yes, gold is a heavy system with strong spin orbit coupling. Yeah. But here, why? Well, I, I would say the trick is if you say spin orbit coupling is small, that's only half of the sentence. You should say spin orbit coupling is small with respect to what? And the point is, what we should compare it with? We should compare it with the crystal field splitting. And so for atom, the, you've got just a level. The crystal field splitting for atom is small. So even though nominally the spin orbit coupling is small here, uh, in comparison with uh, yet even smaller, so to, so to speak, crystal, sp crystal field splitting, it is large. So, like it or not, the verdict is, the uh, TZ term is uh, here to stay. It may uh, cause uh, the, mm, it, it may ch spoil the apparent dependence of the spin magnetic moment, say on the cluster size. It may uh, make the spin magnetic moment look anisotropic falsely. Uh, and you cannot really get rid of it just for the small systems, atoms and clusters, where X-ray absorption spectroscopy, XMCD would be, uh, let's say, most in need. So it's doomed here to mess with your results forever, I'm afraid. Ah, finite core hole flight time. So that was one risk. Now comes another risk. Um, we already heard about it. So the core hole is ejected from the, uh, the electron is ejected from the core levels. There is a core hole. However, the core hole does not stay here forever. It is going to be filled eventually by other processes. So uh, the core hole has a finite lifetime. So just thinking in, a, again, the dirty way, you can think so you've a finite lifetime. Finite lifetime is associated with a finite width. So you can think that actually the electrons don't come from a well-defined level, but from a kind of a band that has a finite bit. Typically one EV, let me say, depends on which uh, level it is. Uh, I mean, you sh if you want to be uh, precise, you must not rely on this, uh, uh, say, relations because they are anyway not that easy. But say you just take quantum me mechanics of Messiah and there you find it in a proper way done. Anyhow, so that means that if you calculate a spectrum, any spectrum, so if you just uh, plot it as you get it, you got this raw spectrum, this. Uh, so sort of kind of like a fractal curve. You broaden it by convoluting it with a Lorentzian and you get a nice smooth curve. And that's what you always do. You don't publish this fractal, you publish this nice smooth magenta curve. Now, so this, cal this calculated spectrum should be broadened with Lorentzian and you should actually uh, st start with the Fermi level because uh, you are interested in uh, unoccupied states only, right? You are, because the electron cannot go to occupied states, it can only unoccupied states. So actually your integral here should start from the en energy. So there is kind of a cutoff. Now, if you ignore this cutoff, it can be proven that this uh, mm, convolution is equivalent to evaluating the absorption spectrum for uh, with an imaginary part for energy with a small imaginary part edit. Uh, Didier started with it in the beginning. He spoke, yes, we do it for imaginary potential. So imaginary potential actually is like this imaginary energy and so on. So you got the broadening related with the core hole in this way. And actually it's convenient to, to, uh, to uh, use this uh, image, to calculate the spectrum for this imagined energy. Because your uh, energy edge does not have to, your energy match does not have to be so dense. And you don't miss any resonance. Suppose if you have very, very fine resonance in, if, if in your spectrum, if your mesh is not dense enough, you can just easily miss it or it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, so it's a very efficient, a very uh, sort of uh, convenient way to, 
calculate the spectrum to add to calculate it for, uh, with a small imaginary part added to the energy. However, it is equivalent only if there is no cutoff below the Fermi energy. And so the question is uh, whether employing this imaginary energy can uh, uh, calculate can affect the broaden spectrum significantly. Whether it really matters the fact that you neglect the Fermi energy cutoff with this uh, with this uh, uh, trick. Uh huh. So uh, what you can do is that you can compare or calculate the spectra where you shift the emphasis, where you shift the broadening between imaginary energy and the Lorentzian convol convolution. You can do it because convolution of two Lorentzians is again Lorentzian with the width equal to the sums. So you can just make an experiment that you know that you want to simulate spectrum with a well-defined uh, core hole width and you divide it between uh, broadening by the imaginary energy and by broadening by the Lorentzian, by the, let's say, remaining Brodian. And uh, hmm. Hmm. Ah. It's mm -hmm. No. So, um, so uh, we did an exper computer experiment for an LH. Uh, you uh, have two edges, L2 edge, L3 edge. The uh, total width uh, to which the spectrum should be broadened is taken from the literature, and you have either small uh, imaginary energy or large in imaginary energy, and the rest is supplied by the broadening. Uh, via the Lorentzian. Uh, so if you do, so here one should focus on comparing the dark uh, orange curve and the magenta curve. So for X-ray absorption spectrum, frankly, it doesn't really matter. If you zoom here, you can see some differences, but they are not that big. I mean, and if you look on the proper scale, doesn't matter to you. However, if you focus on the X-ray absorption uh, on the XMCD spectrum, you can see that the if you broaden by image by large imaginary energy, you got kind of a spurious doublet here. So the peak is split into two. So it seems that the L3 XMCD spectrum appears to be hypersensitive to the way the broadening is split between the imaginary energy and the uh, core hole broadening uh, and the uh, Lorentzian broadening by convolution. Why this is so? Um, this is my favorite plot. So you, if you look how you actually compose the spectrum, it is composed of four different spectra. Now, if your uh, spectrum, this is what you have. If you imagine the energy is large, so you actually add uh, four spectra, but uh, here here is the Fermi energy cutoff. And the spectra, these four edges, these four edges don't have the same core energy. There is uh, this exchange splitting between the core levels. So you can see that the, the edges here are all a bit shifted about 0.3 eV. So if you add them, you then get this spurious uh, doublet. If you uh, smooth, broaden these curves by the Lorentzian before you add them, you don't get such an artifact. Okay, so if the individual components are smooth before summation, the resulting spectrum is smooth. Otherwise, you get this uh, feature. So the verdict, yes, simulating, uh, uh, you can s simulate the uh, broadening of the spectra by imaginary uh, of, uh, energy, but only for energies well above the absorption edge. If you are interested in the region close to the, ah, close to the edge, spurious features may appear and so uh, practical advice this imaginary energy, energy should be typically about 10 times smaller than really the, the full width and half maximum that you will apply so, so in that case majority of your work will be done by the Lorentzians in that case you can mm, avoid these artifacts at the, the edge right x-ray magnetic linear dichroism Actually, I don't like this word, I have to admit, but I am 
to, uh, I'm not important enough to affect it, so I have to live with it. Uh, what it means, actually, uh, right, so um, before I spoke about linear dichroism, so that was the difference between spectra for two perpendicular orientations of the polarization vector. And I said, I'm omitting magnetism. I, I was talking about non-magnetic system. If the system is magnetic, in that case, geometry interferes with magnetism. So uh, in case that the system is cubic, that means there would be no dichroism without uh, magnetism. In that case, usually we speak about X-ray magnetic linear dichroism. So that means, uh, yeah, so you focus on systems where, like cubic systems, where there would be no linear dichroism without this uh, magnetism, and you measure the uh, dichroism due to magnetism. It can be achieved by two ways that are sometimes equivalent, <laughs> not always. Uh, so uh, either you keep the orientation of the magnetization and what you rotate, uh, sorry, either you, keep the orient the, either you keep your polarization vector and you rotate the magnetization, or you could keep the magnetization and you switch the orientation of the polarization vectors. Uh, uh, so in case that there is no geometric dichroism, just the magnetic component, so how, uh, again, the, this XMLD, uh, this dichroism arises, uh, typically you can think that it's because the uh, individual levels from which the spectrum arises are themselves not spherical. They are not spherically symmetric. Their sum is, but they themselves are not. And so the transition from states with the different mu actually are different. They have like, different probabilities depending on the orientation of the, of the um, polarization vector. Say, so, so, I mean, you can imagine that if the polarization vector is oriented in this way, so suppose along this direction, so the transition from this uh, uh, orbital would be more probable than from this orbital, and so on. If they had the same energy, these differences would compensate if you add them. However, uh, they do not, because there is this uh, relativistic exchange splitting between these levels. That means this, this should be actually mu in our uh, uh, mostly used uh, then notation, doesn't matter. So transition from states with different, you have different probabilities and have different energies. So therefore, actually, they do not compensate and you've got this dichroism effect. Uh, how typically it looks like, this is uh, dichroism absorption spectrum, linear dichroism, XMCD on iron. Hmm, yeah. So why I'm showing it, first, the typical feature, the typical shape of the XMCD spectrum here is one peak, another peak. For XMCD, it's kind of a derivative. And actually, in some models, I mean, these guys introduced, you can show that it's really like derivative of the XMCD. That's one thing. Another thing is, if you, I'm not sure whether you can see the numbers, but basically the magnitude of the XMLD it's about, uh, again, magnitude, uh, about uh, by order of magnitude smaller than from XMCD. So that means to measure XMLD, you have to be more careful. And what I would say probably more important, in XMCD, XMCD is proportional to the magnetization. That means if there is no magnetization, uh, or not, no, mag if there is no magnetic moment, total magnetization is zero, you don't get any XMCD. So that means, in practice, you don't get but uh, let's say you don't get XMCD if you have antiferromagnetic system, right? Because uh, for, for one atom you get, let me, let me say, positive, but for the other one negative. So these bastards con uh, compensate. However, for uh, XMLD, it's, uh, uh, let's say, proportional to the square of the magnetization. So that means for antiferromagnetic system, you would still get non-zero uh, Ah, okay, so that should be <laughs> all right. Just uh, think, please, that this uh, that this is um, crossed. Okay, <laughs> anyway, just to confuse you a bit. Anyway, so that means, but this is true. So uh, XMLD would be non-zero also for antiferromagnetic systems, for which XMCD would be zero. That's basically what I wanted to say. Right. So uh, I started by saying that actually the dichroism generated by geometry and by uh, magnetism often interpenetrate, right? So this would be in case that, I mean, 
iron is pretty cubic, right? So in this case, it's purely magnetic. But usually, if you have magnetic systems and focus on the dichroic spectra, you've got both. Right, so that was, uh, now we come to these non collinear systems, where actually I would like to uh, introduce a case study of a system where you've got both of them. So, uh, manganese monolayer on tungsten. Uh, the, it, it's BCC surface, so that means the surface itself is uh, not symmetric, not cubic. So there's this 2C, V, blah, blah, blah. Basically, you, got the, you see it differently in one direction and in the direction perpendicular to it. So here you would have a linear dichroism even without magnetism, right? Uh, now, uh, early studies assumed that the uh, uh, manganese on tungsten is typically antiferromagnetic with some superstructures. Uh, however, later people did as deep clever STM, as sophisticated STM measurements and sophisticated calculations combining ab initio and model calculation, blah, blah, blah. And so they came to the conclusion that actually it should be quite of a, a funny structure, antiferromagnetic cycloidal spin spiral. It's a problem yet even to say it, just to calculate it, but uh, so, uh, right, so it, it's like cycloidal spin spiral, so it's like uh, that these uh, magnetic moments are kind of spirals in the direction of the spread of the wave, but it's antiferromagnetic, so it's always two of them kind of. Right. Uh, however, uh, I mean, you can assume also uh, others, other possible uh, arrangements would give you similar STM picture, like spin density wave or the, uh, the spin spiral could be helical. So it would be like, I mean, perpendicular, perpendicular to the spread of the wave and so on. Right. So that was the state. Uh, there were some fancy paper, papers about it. Now, uh, however, the scanning tunneling microscopy does not or may not provide the whole story. First, uh, actually, STM can fall victim to its success. It's local. So that means actually you probe just a small part of the system and it's, uh, you cannot be, of, uh, frankly, sometimes sure if the system is messy. And the system is messy. It's actually a terrace surface and these tungstens are actually islands close to the terraces. So, I mean, the system is not that homogeneous at all. And so, uh, are you really now investigating a representative piece of the, uh, of the system? Um, you hope you are. Um, another thing, it, uh, it uh, STM actually does not uh, uh, measure directly this direction of the magnetic moment. Again, it's an uh, indirect measurement, so you not you just see that there are some oscillations, but you don't know whether it's spin density wave, helical, whatever. And uh, yeah, and uh, actually, it's quite important stuff uh, that to perform the, uh, and uh, actually, but, but it's kind of specific, I would say, to perform the measurement takes some time. And these spin spirals, they like to be dead pinned. Now, what is, uh, I, I don't actually like this word very much, but it basically means that you assume that, or, or that they assume these clever guys, that the spirals don't stand there forever. They kind of move a bit around the, uh, let's say the orchard of a spiral somehow moves a bit in time. So they are dead pinned. And uh, if you measure it and it takes you time, so you don't really, uh, you may be just measuring, uh, I mean, this is the case whether, whether the measuring the average is the same like averaging the measurements, right? So, so in STM, the measurement takes time, so you just measure average magnetization or let's say average magnetic state. While in X-ray absorption s s spectroscopy, the process is instantaneous, so in, in that case, we really have, we really aver average the states, uh, whatever. Ah. I, Okay, I, I got confused, never mind. So, we've got iron, so, uh, I mean, clever people made experiments, iron monolayer on tungsten. Uh, you see that actually it's not that uniform, you've got your terraces, but the terraces are not really uh, sort of linear, you've got various islands and so on. Now, 
the model of the system is so this is the uh, tungsten 110 surface green atoms are uh, manganese atoms and the uh, uh, red rods depict the uh, orientation and of the magnetic moment so the magnetic moment i mean this is a side view so it's antiferromagnetic uh, right it's antiferromagnetic but it's uh, helical it's uh, rotating so this is yeah whatever mm -hmm. yeah so you measure the exams uh, the linear dichroism so that means the direction your light uh, comes uh, perpendicular to the to the uh, surface and you measure the difference between absorption for one orientation and another orientation of the polarization vector and uh, yeah so these are the results so uh, you've got the measurement and you've got experiment and here is the XA, uh, this linear dichroism I could also call it it's geometric and magnetic there are both contributions there right because the system is magnetic but uh, you would get the dichroism also with the mag magnetic field and you calculate this for cycloidal spiral and for helical spiral and you see first that uh, the spectrum or the dichroic spectrum I mean the absorption spectrum doesn't really care whether the uh, spiral is helical or cycle but the dichroism spectrum depends on whether you choose uh, whether you model your system with cycled spiral or with helical spiral and they give rise to significantly different uh, XLD di dichroic signals mm -hmm. so based on this one can confirm that the uh, magnetic state is indeed the uh, cycloidal spiral so uh, okay mm. I, I would like to invent a term okay so instead of XLD I would like to talk or XMLD I would like to talk about XLD in the presence of magnetism if you please could just then spread this terminology you would make me happy um, right uh, what I would like to point magnetism in this case not just a mere perturbation yes I mean actually in the initially you might think actually so the system is uh, yeah let me try it so hope this is, the system is actually not not uh, mm, cubic so depending on whether your polarization vector is uh, oriented in one way or perpendicular way this would co be the main contribution to the dichroism and the magnetism would be just a slight slight perturbation to it no it's not i mean uh, right so here is just the spectrum uh, the absorption spectrum calculated for a uh, antiferromagnetic cycloidal spiral for a paramagnetic system simulated by DLM. We don't have to s simply f for a paramagnetic system and for a non-magnetic system, right? Paramagnetic systems mean that you have, have got their magnetic moments, but they are so disordered that their sum is zero. But this green would be non-magnetic moment. Now, from non-magnetic moment, the spectrum would be quite different from fr from fr from the system for magnetic, for antiferromagnetic or paramagnetic spectrum. It would, I mean, the peak intensity would, would be much higher, and also the XLD, the, the dichroism spectrum, would be quite different. And actually, uh, you can uh, guess why, because if you just look on the density of unoccupied states for antiferromagnetic systems so here you've got a minority band here you've got a majority band okay vice versa majority band minority band fine and for non-magnetic spectrum the densities of states look, looks completely different so basically having a system so that means having ma magnetic manganese and non-magnetic manganese is like comparing iron with nickel or, or basically two heavy this basically is like having two different elements I mean, whether the system is magnetic, or, I mean, non-magnetic or, pa or paramagnetic, it, it means like changing, like going to another element in the periodic table. So, right, so what did I say, really? Right, so the spectra for the same structure in the non-magnetic state and paramagnetic state differ, right? So the magnetism is not just a perturbation, okay? It's really the dichroism and, yeah, basically that's what I want to say. Right, uh, spin-orbit coupling matters. Uh, I said the spin orbit coupling is the only way how you can link the direction of the magnetic moments to the crystal lattice, to the orientation of crystal lattice. So here you calculate uh, the dichroic spectrum 
for uh, antiferromagnetic system with spin orbit coupling suppressed. I mean, I should say uh, you cannot suppress it completely because in that case you would have no difference between L2 and L3 edge, but suppose you do it, uh, you can do it, say. So if you suppress the spin orbit coupling, you get, say, this uh, olive curve. And if you have then antiferromagnetic system with magnetic moments oriented in three perpendicular directions, the spectra look the, the dichroic spectra look quite different. So that means that the spin orbit coupling really is important. It, it matters. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, now, I said, <laughs> I lied, in the beginning that uh, for antiferromagnetic systems you cannot get XMCD. That's not quite true. Uh, it depends now. Yes, for antiferromagnetic, for let's say collinear decent uh, uh, common antiferromagnetic systems, you cannot get XMCD signal because they subtract each other. However, uh, assume you've got uh, this weird structure. Actually, the system is not weird; it's cubic. What is weird is its magnetic structure, right? The orientation of the magnetic moment. So this is some I don't know how to pronounce it anyway. So, uh, but the moments are non-collinear. But the total magnetization is zero. And uh, uh, so now, if you think of XMCD generated on each of these atoms, so it would be this, this uh, dotted curve. So yes, on each individual atoms. If the magnetization, or, or if the light, if the direction of the incoming light would be parallel to a magnetic moment, you would get a, uh, a relatively large signal. But then if you add them together, you would get zero. However, if you uh, perform uh, this, this calculation, actually, so if you perform the calculation for a fixed orientation of the X-ray spectra, say I believe it would be suppose perpendicular to the to the screen, and add them together, you still get a small but non-zero, definitely non-zero XMCD signal. It's because the uh, the magnetic moments are not they are not. Uh, uh, parallel, they are non-collinear, and it depends on the magnetic symmetry group. Uh, I mean, we spoke already, I think, with someone, I don't know, that you've got whole websites and tables with magnetic symmetries, and uh, again, I don't know much about it, but uh, simply, it's the magnetic symmetry that matters, right? So you can get XMCD spectrum, even for antifagmatic uh, materials, provided they are sufficiently complicated. Right, so to conclude, first, you can get further with X-ray absorption spectrum and X-ray linear di di dichroism than with X-ray absorption spectrum alone. Second, some rules are your friend. However, uh, beware of the bad guy that is a term that is here to stay. Employing uh, imaginary energy to coarsen the energy grid is convenient, fine, use it. However, if you are concerned with XMCD, uh, most of the broadening has to be done by convoluting your calculated spectra with Lorentzian. Uh, right? And fourth, dichroic spectra can be useful also when dealing with antiferromagnetic, non-collinear uh, magnetic states. Thank you for sharing this with me. Uh -huh. But that involves uh, calculation of the wavefunctions and yes. gradients. Yes. Uh, how is that entered into this uh, these functions? I don't think it and uh, if it does, I don't know how. It's, but it's not uh, uh, in one of the calculations. No, no, no. I just mentioned it to confuse the enemy. Uh, but uh, <laughs> not really. Um, may, may I answer this? So we said. Um, the expression you have seen is derived at the end from linear response formulas. If you start from Z and there is another thermodynamical definition of what magnetism means, but if you do take these two ingredients and you start, at one point you go into the direction of the very uh, 
a phase formulation what you have seen, but you can go in another direction and uh, formulate it in Greek terms what we did some years ago. So you can use uh, get a, a expression in terms of Greek terms completely equivalent to what you have just seen, and you can further um, um, discuss what are the various terms that are giving rise to it. And then you will see there is something what I call fun flag like. And this at the end turns out to be to look for expectation value of L Z of the angle momentum. And the other one is um, Landau like. So, so you have a counterpart in these origins of orbital magnetism that you know from orbital uh, susceptibilities. <coughs> yeah. But so the so crucial point at the end is, of course, which of these contributions is probed by XMCD, and definitely XMCD is probing what I call um, flag line, so expectation of LZ. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So it means at the end you cannot expect that even if all the sum rules and whatever is absolute perfect, you, I think you cannot expect a one-to-one -one corresponding what you would get out of that complete formula. <coughs> formula for the complete of the moment. I, I would say XMCD is filtering out a certain part of it. Okay. But dominating part of it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, thanks. Yeah, do you have any idea how the interplay between the imaginary part of the energy and the lifetime might affect photo emission spectra? <laughs> I would say as long as you do not subtract two uh, opposite uh, quantities, it should not. Because here actually the trick came, as I see it, ba technically basically from the fact that the spectrum is obtained by, you've got some plus, plus some minus, and uh, you cut them with the bloody Fermi energy. And uh, if, they, if you cut them before being broadened, so to speak, uh, and add them, you've got so I think, yeah. So it, it may affect may, maybe the dichroism, or if you say uh, and in photo emission also they measure the dichroism, and so it provided that the levels from which the dichroic spectra uh, basically are generated, if they are not the same, in that case uh, I would be careful. But yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> in simple, I can say that we, that we cheat, but uh, anyway, uh, the point is that we know that how it is. All right, I calculate, I, I do the electronic stretch cal calculations, and that tells me um, how I have, what it is, moment. I know that my band should cont the full band should contain 10 d electrons. In the atomic system. Yes. And so what I do that I integrate the full weight, exactly. I, I integrate the full weight and uh, basically I determine the energy. Uh, let me say, I de de determine the end of my d band by assuming that uh, I have got 10 electrons, 10 d electrons up to this energy. So that means. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, I have got the density of states. Uh, look somehow. But usually the density of states doesn't quite have 10. Pardon? The density of states doesn't quite have 10. Exactly, exactly. It doesn't. But basically, you. this is density of states, density of these states. And now I start to integrate it from the bottom of the band. And I uh, calculate the, how should I say, cumulate, cumulate, cumulative integrand, and I integrate it up to a certain energy, which I would call ED, up to a certain energy, so that this area is 10. And if this area is 10, I say, OK, this, at this energy, my 3D band ends. 
you can do it only if you do calculations, of course. You cannot do it in, in experiment. I mean, when they, uh, so I don't, and I don't have here background, or let me say, yeah, or let's just say, okay, here, here, I, I mean, in, in the calculations, of course, I can have background. I mean, when I calculate then this, these areas, I just have the background because this is just some of two um, spectra. So in the calculations, the background is, let me say, I do not have background in the calculation, <laughs> let me say. But, but the crucial is basically where I end this, where I define the end of the D-band, so to speak. And that's what I guess, uh, what I guess from this integration. So we, it, it is not the same procedure uh, which the experimentalists apply as they uh, subtract this target, arc tangent, and th th they have got their, their issues. So I bypass them. Yes. So um, recipes. Uh, uh, this is also homemade recipes, so to speak. But, uh, well, it is reproducible, I would say, this recipe, yes. Mm -hmm. And to, uh, to localize uh, like which site the oxygen was residing mm -hmm. with the spectra. Uh, but I would say in that case, wouldn't like a, a regular XAS be sufficient? Because I would see that uh, you would uh, use, you would care about the polarization of the light if you also care about like the direction, especially the direction of the molecule, if you have like a diatomic uh, uh, molecule and how it's oriented. But I would think that most of the time the XAS uh, can solve. So uh, my question is like, uh, uh, I fail to understand here what the the, the dichroism actually brought of new information. Right. The dichroism here basically it's uh, as I said in the, or tried to say in the beginning, you can speak about dichroism or we can you can speak about polar polar polarized spectra. So in this case, I've got two spectra. So this is the, the dichroism, di spectra. I've got two spectra. So that's what I would mean by dichroism. But because, of course, to get, di di let's say, to get spectra, I would add these two curves. And to get dichroism, I would subtract them. And either I can, let me say, focus on each of these two curves separately, or I can add them and subtract them, and then I would focus on the some and the difference, but they should give you equivalent uh, information. Okay, so and then uh, 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 next question come to this, like, uh, have you stub stubborn upon like a, a system or a study that is, it was not so obvious that, that uh, you would have to use dichroism? For example, uh, you, uh, at first you don't think that direction matters for what you're studying, but uh, you could not solve with uh, like just a regular XAS, and if you if you start doing dichroism, you actually. Uh, uh, I'm not really it. sure. Let me say first. I mean, this is this is not my work. I mean, and uh, actually about uh, half or maybe majority of the slides are showed are not my work. That's but but uh, uh, hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, Jen. Okay, short answer is I don't know. Generally, the more information we have got, the better. So if you have got polar, polar, polarized spectra, uh, I would say the problem here is experimental, as I understand. The experimentalists ha have got problems in measure uh, uh, polarized spectra, and that's, as I understand, they have got problems really in orienting the sample, so they don't really know exactly which polarization they measure or something like that. I'm no, no, I mean, I'm not experimental, but when they talk to me, they are actually saying, well, but this is not so, no, no, no. but, uh, okay, shortly I don't know. Generally, of course, the more spectra you have, the more uh, lucky you are, the, the more ha uh, happy you are, but uh, as, Specific example of essay, people would be thinking something, and then when I don't know. Yeah, I was just thinking about the, the more about the experiment because usually in the calculations you can just do it and then you have more information and it's better. 